Hi again, Mark here from Talking Bass. Last week we had a look at the jazz standard Billy's Bounce by the legendary Charlie Parker. It's a bebop blues piece and a great introduction to melodic jazz playing. This week we're going to look at breaking down the chord progression as an introduction to analysis and this will help a lot with going forward into walking bass lines and solos. So we're going to be getting into some of that music theory and harmony talk that you all like me to cover in as simple a way as possible. As always, the lesson material is all there over at TalkingBass.net. Just follow the link in the info below, and while you're there, be sure to check out the lesson map, where you'll find over 450 free bass lessons on pretty much every topic imaginable. Then, if you want to take things further, go check out the courses page, where you'll find an assortment of in-depth programs on everything from beginner bass guitar, through to reading, chord tones, walking bass, and much, much more. So, when you're working on learning a jazz standard, be it a blues or any other tune, it's always a good idea to break down the harmony. You want to know what's going on with the chords. You want to know the notes of those chords, and you want to know the functional harmony of the piece. So that's going to mean how the chords operate within a key, how the chords move from one to the next, and any other theory surrounding the progression. All of this is important when it comes to creating walking bass lines and solos. If you don't know the layout of the land, you'll find it much harder to navigate the landscape and create, you know, any melodic content. The chord tones, the notes of the chords, are the consonant notes and the framework that we work around. They are, for want of a better term, the right notes. So by playing around the chord tones, you'll always be outlining the progression, and from a soloing perspective, you'll be playing the notes that fit and that's because they're in the chords, you know, they play nice. Now, there's obviously way more to developing a jazz vocabulary than just outlining the chord tones and arpeggios, you know. You know, that's not enough. But the chord tones are the framework around which everything else sits. So our first port of call is breaking down the chords so that we at least know what notes we're looking at. So, let's work through these chords. Now, I won't be spending too much time on the basics of chord progression because I've covered all that stuff multiple times on this channel. I'll link to some videos on seventh chord arpeggios in the info below. To save time, I'm just going to play through each in turn with a basic primer on what we're looking at. So, let's start with our first chord of F7. I'm, I'm going to play all of these down in this low area here, as low as I can go, but remember you can move these wherever you need them. So. First of all, we have F7, and that's a dominant 7 chord, okay? So it's F dominant 7. And uh, a dominant 7 chord is just a major triad with a flat 7 on top, so a minor 7 on the top. So, for F7 we have F, A, C, and E flat. So that's the F major triad, F, A, C, and then we just put that minor 7 up on the top, the E flat. So, I'm playing the first fret of the E string, open A, then uh, third fret uh, of the A string for the C, and then that E flat I'm getting there at the first fret of the D string. That's a very common position for it. And remember, you could take that and move it up here, so I could play it up at the eighth fret of the uh, of the A string. Make the blade up here, wherever you want to move it, just for that fingering position. And there's many different ways that you can play all of these arpeggios. I could play it like this, you know, I could play it, play it like this, starting on the fourth finger, and we'll come to that a little later. The next chord is B flat seven. So it's the same chord as the F7, but just shifted up to B flat. So I'm gonna play here with the first fret of the A string. So B flat, D, F, A flat. First fret A string, up and D string, third fret of the D string, and then that A flat there at the first fret of the G string. So we had F7 and B flat seven. Next we have a B diminished seven chord. Now, a diminished seven chord is a diminished triad with a diminished seventh interval on the top. Now don't worry too much about that, I do cover that all in the 7th arpeggios uh, lesson, which is in the info, linked to in the info below. So uh, I'll just run through what the notes are going to be there. So a diminished uh, triad on B would be B, D and F. So we've got the root note, the minor third, and then the flat five, or the uh, diminished fifth. So B, D, F. So there I'm playing it second and fifth fret on the A string, and then that third fret at the, uh, at the D string. And then for the diminished seventh, we have the A flat, okay? So if you were to think of the different sevenths, B to A sharp is a major seventh, B to A natural is a minor seventh, and then the diminished seventh is that A flat, okay? But don't get too caught up into all the theory of it, just accept what this is going to be. So we've got B, D, F, and A flat. Okay, so what we can do now is take that D, uh, the fifth fret of the A string, and just play it on the open string. Okay, so that is the B 
diminished 7. So now we have those three chords. F7, B7, and then B diminished 7. Next chord, we're back to F7. Okay, same old arpeggio. Then we move back to the B flat 7. And then we're back to the F7. Good old blues. Then we've got the A minor 7 and D7. So for the A minor 7, there's several different ways to play this. Uh, we could play it uh, open A string, C, E, and then the open G. So this is a minor uh, triad with a minor 7th on the top. So uh, if I was to play it down here, for instance, we'd have the A, the C, then the E, and then the G up at the top. So you can see there, root, minor 3rd, and then the 5th, perfect 5th, and then the minor 7th up on the top. Okay, that's our minor 7 arpeggio. The minor triad, minor 7th. So you can play it there starting on the first finger. So that would be 5th fret of the E string, then the 8th fret of the E string, and then we'd have 7th fret A string, and then the 5th fret on the D string. So that's a popular way of playing it. You could also play it here. So 4th finger there, taking the 5th fret of the E string, then play the C at the 3rd fret of the A string, then the E at the 2nd fret of the D string, and then the G at the 5th fret of the, uh, of the D string. So we've got this 4th finger pattern. Or you can play it from the open A string, just the same pattern we had here, but just using those open strings. And you might find that a little bit easier to, uh, you know, in terms of playing it, so you can then shift up for the uh, for the D7. So because we are going to play through all of these in a minute. So that's the A. A minor 7. And like I said, try playing it in all those different positions and then whatever is going to work for you. You know, you want to learn them all. For D7, we've just got the same arpeggio that we had for F, but we shifted up onto the D. So here's a D, 5th fret of the A string, and then you could play the F sharp and the A uh, at the 4th fret and the 7th fret on the D string. So D, F sharp, A, that's your major triad, and then the flat 7 up on the top, the C natural, which I'm playing at the 5th fret of the G string. So you can play it there with the 2nd finger, or you could play it with the 4th finger. Okay. So you can see there, 4th finger, 3rd finger, 1st finger for the A there at the 2nd fret of the, uh, of the G string, and then the C. So it's more important to actually know the notes here rather than just memorising a simple pattern. So we've got those two. Or you could play it from the open D string. So open D string and then the F sharp at the 4th fret there, and then the A and then the C. Okay, so that's just a different way of playing it. Always worth knowing multiple different positions. So in terms of playing through these two, I'm going to play this with the open A and then take the fourth finger. Okay, so that's the A minor 7 and D7. Next we move on to G minor 7. So once again we can take that uh, the minor 7 that we saw here for, uh, for the A and just shift it onto the G. So we've got G, B flat, D and F. Root, minor third, perfect fifth, and then the minor seven again. So third fret and sixth fret on the E string, fifth fret A string, and then the third fret on the D string. That's uh, useful fingering for the uh, G minor seven. And then for the C seven that comes up, once again, we take that, uh, that dominant seven that we've seen all the way through, we just play it up there on the C. So third fret, A string, second fret, fifth fret, D string, and then the third fret on the G string. But like I always say, there are multiple different ways to play this, okay? And then for the last two bars, we've got this turnaround of F7, D7, G minor 7, and C7. All chords that we've already covered. F7, D7, G minor 7, C7. And that's the whole set of chords. So once you've learned the dominant 7 arpeggio, you know, we see that a lot in there. We've got the F7, the B flat 7, the C7, we've got the D7. Uh, and then we've got the minor 7 arpeggios, like the G minor 7 and the A minor 7. And then the only kind of odd one out is going to be that diminished 7 on the B. So you just have to get that under your fingers in whichever position you want to play it. So now we've got some of that harmony under our fingers. Let's try playing those arpeggios through the progression. And what we're going to do here is play the arpeggios as simple eighth notes. One and two and three and four and. Uh, and we're just going to play them in, in ascent for each bar. Then when we have two chords per bar, the eighth notes are going to still fit okay. You know, so one and two and three and four and. So 
let's just try that away from any tracks or anything like that. Just try playing through the arpeggios. So we start with the F7. One and two and three, four. Then the B flat seven. One and two and. And then the B diminished seven. Three and four and. So one and two and three and four and. So that's the only tricky part here. So and two and three, four. One and two and three and four and. So next we're back to the F7 for two bars. So one and two and three, four. One and two and three, four. So I'm just sticking to just playing up through them. Then B flat seven again. One and two and three, four. One and two and three, four. And then we've got F7 for a bar. One and two and three, four. Now we've got the A minor seven and D seven. So whichever way is gonna work best for you. So up the A minor seven. One and two and, and then three and four and. And then we're down onto the G minor seven, one and two and three, four, and then C seven, one and two and three, four. Then we've got that turnaround of F, D seven, and G minor seven, and up the C seven. So you might need to work on that, you know, just stringing those together. Okay. And you might find that that the D7 is a lot easier to play from the fourth finger there, so. And then you can even use the open string on the uh, G minor seven if you find that easier. You know, whichever way you find easiest. So that's the exercise, and you wanna try that as slow as you need to. Don't worry about metronomes or tracks or anything like that to begin with. Just try playing through those arpeggios, getting them under your fingers, because if you don't know those arpeggios yet, or you can't string them together, you're going to find them quite tough. So you'll need to build that up. And then you can just gradually start bringing the time into play, just keeping up your foot tapping. One and two and three, four, one. Okay, so you can just try it like that. Then when you feel confident, you can try playing along to the backing track. Now I've got a track here at 90 beats per minute. So it's pretty slow and it gives you time to, you know, move around and, you know, get your bearings. <laughs> so let's try that. A one, two, three, four. So when you play those arpeggios along with that chord progression, you'll be able to hear how they work with those chords. You know, you're outlining the harmony. Now, as well as learning to play those arpeggios here in this lower position, I'd also recommend trying them in other areas of the fretboard, just to familiarize yourself with some of the other fingerings. So, you know, try them possibly up around at this eighth fret of the A string there for the F7, and then try working out the other arpeggios around there. And like I said, you need to work on the different fingerings for them. So, you know, for an F7, I can play it on the second finger, I can play it on the first finger, I can play it on the fourth finger, and I talk about all of those positions and fingerings in the seventh arpeggios uh, lessons that I've put out there. So you want to try that and then just try working them out yourself, just navigating through them. So here I'll just try along with the track again and I'll be playing the arpeggios up in this mid position. One, two, three, four. Thank you. 
So this is the beauty of chord turns and why they're so valuable to us as bass players. When we play walking bass lines, we're aiming to create an interesting melodic line through the chord progression while outlining the harmony. Extract any walking line from a tune and you should be able to hear that progression in there. And remember, all of the skills and knowledge you acquire from studying jazz in this way will improve your playing in all other styles too. And this is why the great Motown bass lines of guys like James Jameson are so interesting. Now, just to expand on that a little in terms of outlining the chord progressions, what I'm going to do here is play along to a click. Okay, so we're just going to have a click on two and four. And uh, I'm just going to play through those arpeggios again. And even though we won't have any of the, uh, of the track there, any of the chords playing, you'll still be able to hear that chord progression as we play through it. Okay, so here we are with the click at 100. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. all of those chords as we worked through outlining the arpeggios. So I'm going to expand on the walking side of this in a couple of weeks. In this lesson, we're going to focus more on breaking everything down. So now you understand the individual chords that you're looking at from a note perspective. Let's look at the bigger picture and the chord progression itself. So Billy's Bounce is basically a blues in F, but you'll notice a few common substitutions and expansions that really add that jazzy bebop flavor to proceedings. So first let's look at a much more cut down straight 12 bar blues in F. So here we have F7 for four bars, B flat seven for two bars, F7 for two bars, then C7 for two bars, and then F7 for two bars at the end. Now, I haven't included the drop down from C7 to B flat seven that you'll often see. And this, you know, this is about as basic a blues as you could get. And you'll know the sound of it if I just play a simple bass line working through those chords uh, with more of a rock and roll kind of vibe. So here we have it. Well, one, two, three, four. Okay, so this blues makes use of three chords in the key of F. One, four, and five. F, B flat, and C. So they're the chords one, four, and five because that's where they are in the F major scale. One, F, two, three, four, B flat, and five, the C. So F is one, B flat is four, and C is five. Now, in good old traditional diatonic harmony, chords one, four, and five would be major triads. So that'd be F major, B flat major, and C major. And then a seventh chord, you'd have F major seven, then B flat major seven, and then C seven. Okay, so. Okay. But in a blues, they all get turned into dominant seven chords. So we have F seven, B flat seven, and C7. Now don't worry too much about that. Those dominant sevens are used for flavor. It's just, you know, the blues. And you'll find many a video on YouTube discussing why they work this way. Adam Neely has an interesting take on the dominant seven movement in a recent video that I'll list in the info below. But really, at the end of the day, chords one and four become dominant seventh because blues. Now, what I'm going to do here very quickly is expand on this basic spine of a progression so you can see what's going on in Billy's Bounce. So first things first, we're going to add a B flat seven into bar two, and this turns the progression into a quick change blues, and it breaks things up uh, for a little bit more interest in those first four bars. So now instead of this, we get this. So there's a bit more interest in there. Next, we're going to place a C7 in the final bar as a turnaround. Now you should know by watching my other videos that chords five to one, 
The authentic or perfect cadence is the strongest cadence in music. When placed at the end of a phrase, a section or a piece, chord 5 to 1 brings us back around and resolves nicely back to home, hence the term turnaround. So let's hear the progression now with chord 5 in there at the end. So we have F7, B flat 7, F7, B flat 7. F7, C7, F7, and now C7, so that C7 brings us nicely back into the F. Next, I'm going to take that two bars of C7 and break it up into a bar of G minor 7 and a bar of C7. This is a 2-5 substitution, so think chord 2 and chord 5. Anytime we have a chord 5, we can switch it to a 2-5. This is because the 2 chord is basically the 5 of the 5 chord. So 2-5 progressions are a common substitution for a 5, and you can also do the opposite and simplify a 2-5 progression to a single 5, which can be really useful when soloing at high speed. So now instead of the C7, which we'd play as this, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, we now have this. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and back to the F. So you can hear there how we have this step, if I, if I just played in basic F major, we have this stepping stone effect of G minor seven, C seven, F seven. So you can hear how it works there. Stepping stones back to our home of F, okay? Next, I'm going to do the same thing in the final bar. So we're going to use that substitution of G minor 7, C7, two beats each in place of that bar of C7. So let's have a listen to now how that chord progression sounds. So F7. G minor 7. Here how that uh, expansion of the 2-5 gives us a lot more pull back and those stepping stones back to our chord 1 at the end. Next we're going to add a chord 6 into the bar between the F7 and the G minor 7. And this is a defining part of these jazz blues. The D7 is a chord 6 in the key and acts as a great lead into the G minor 7 because again we have that 5 to 1 cadence. We're thinking D to G. And in effect, we have a temporary minor 2-5-1 in G minor. But don't get fooled by any talk of modulation. We're not shifting key at all. It's simply creating a 6-2-5-1 progression in F. But the D7 is a secondary dominant chord. So D7 is used instead of D minor 7. You know, in the key of F, normally the D would be a D minor 7. But here we're using a, a D7, a secondary dominant chord, to lead strongly into the G minor. So, however you want to see it, that D7 is a secondary dominant on a D, leading us into the G. So, now let's put that D7 in bar 8 after the F7, and then again at bar 11 to give us a 1-6-2-5 turnaround at the end with those nice little stepping stones back to chord 1. So the chord progression now sounds like this. So, chord 1, F7. B flat. F. B flat. F. Up to D7. G minor. C7 and 1625. Now, the progression in that form is pretty much the basis behind all jazz blues progressions, and if you use that as your basis for any bass line in a jam situation, it'd probably work. But Billy's Bounce does have a couple more chords for us to look at. First of all, we have that B diminished 7 chord in bar 2. So if we look at the notes of a B flat 7, we have B flat, D, F, and A flat. Now let's add a flat 9 in there. So the normal 9th, the second, would be C. So a flat 9 is going to be a C flat. So, you know, for, for this uh, lesson, we could just look at that as a B natural, okay? So B flat, D, F, A flat, and then let's put that B natural up on the top. So that's a B flat, uh, uh, B flat 7 flat 9, and f 7 flat 9 chords have got that kind of diminished sound. You can hear it. 
It's got a lot of crunch and a, it's a lot darker sound. So let's have a look at those notes again. We've got B flat, then we've got the B natural, then D, F, and A flat. Now let's look at the notes of a B diminished seven chord. We've got B, D, F, and A flat. So those are the same notes as B flat seven flat nine, but it's missing the B flat, that root note. So that B diminished seven can be used to imply that darker jazzy diminished sound in the second half of the B flat seven bar. So we've got the B flat seven and then it just switches and adds that flat nine in there. And it also creates a chromatic passing note uh, in the bass note uh, of B between the B flat seven and the C, the note C in the following F seven chord. But even though I'm talking theory here, don't worry about what all of that is. All you need to know is that that B diminished seven is used as an expansion on that B flat seven. So it's chord four followed by a diminished seven chord, a half step above. So now we're getting there with the progression. So let's try it out with the new diminished chord. And I won't play through the whole thing here. Let's just play the first few bars. So F seven, then B flat seven, and then B diminished. So. You can hear how we're switching to that diminished sound, that B flat seven flat nine sound. So, and you can hear how it, how it moves nicely back into the F seven because we've got that movement of the B natural moving up to the C. So B flat, B, C, even though that C is actually the fifth in the next chord. So. Finally, we can add yet another 2-5 substitution of that D7 in bar 8. So instead of D7, we're going to have A minor 7, D7. So same principle as what we looked at earlier with the G minor 7 to C7, we're just applying it to the D7 just as an expansion on that dominant 7 chord. So let's have a listen to the final chord progression. So. So Billy's Bounce is basically a jazz blues in F making use of a few 2-5 substitutions, a 1-6-2-5 turnaround and a diminished chord expansion on chord 4. And this is a very, very common way of playing a jazz blues and I'd recommend playing it in this expanded way and maybe a little more simplified as well with the D7 instead of the A minus 7 D7 and without the diminished chord. Okay, so that's a little breakdown of Billy's Bounce. And next week, we'll take a little deeper look at the harmony by learning to play those chords on bass. Playing through standards like this was my introduction to chordal playing as a kid. And you'll find that being able to hear the chords on your instrument in addition to the chord tones and arpeggios will help a lot with learning tunes. So remember to like, comment and subscribe to the channel. The lesson material is all there over at Talking Bass, so go check that out. And remember to visit the lesson map for over 400 free bass lessons on every topic imaginable. Okay, I'll see you next week.